nice shoes. And we're out of New York City. We're right in the heart of New York City, right in Park Avenue. Um, we have offices across North America. Um, it's a reasonably small team. There's four of us on the tech staff, including the CTO. Um, uh, we started out primarily as a color house and doing finishing. That was uh, the traditional workflow. And then as the industry kind of adopted, we kind of expanded into different fields. And so we got VFX now and editorial, and we do a lot of experimental, uh, experiential. And so you can just see like the way we've gone, we went from doing film scanning and color to like now we're doing like, we did an AR app with Boulevard for a museum installation at the National Portrait Gallery or uh, some uh, projection work we did with the uh, National Museum of Qatar, which was, they have internal to the building, they have all this very extreme geometry and they were projecting these very high res videos on it, and each gallery kind of had their own uh, thing and we, Kind of went through all the projection mapping and stuff with them so it's been a uh, you know we we have to cover a lot of different fields and the one thing we kind of keep consistent is that we uh, have a reasonably robust tech stack so uh, i have a reel so you can kind of see the kind of work we do um, and i'll just play that for you here So yeah, you can see a lot of agency work, a lot of beauty real stuff like that. Um, going on to tech, uh, we started looking into cloud initially, it was about 2012. Um, just to give you an example, what we had existent on our tech stack, uh, we did a little bit of cloud hosting, but in like a really kind of normal way, just EC2 instances, a LAMP stack, RDS as the back end, just you know, our help desk system, our intranet site, stuff like that, nothing too, uh, crazy, especially for a little, a small house. Um, we inherited a 50 node uh, mental ray render farm that was a blade server setup, and that was the main on-prem kind of render thing. Uh, we have a huge amount of just big chunk of local storage, so it's all DDN storage with a store next file system on it, so a lot of investment on the on-prem. And the workflow is kind of mostly um, client soup sessions. And so it was color, it was fishing, and so there wasn't a lot of need for huge amounts of scalability because the resource that was kind of limiting that was the actual client rooms. And so you had one room, one kind of big stack iron behind that. It wasn't really a uh, need for a lot of scalability. And so it worked pretty well. Um, of course, that changes as the staff changes and goes on. We uh, had new staff come on that were doing uh, music videos and kind of photorealistic uh, VFX stuff. Um, they were trying to leverage that existing farm, but it just kind of wasn't keeping up. And they, uh, at the same time, they were looking to migrate. This is around the time they were migrating from Mental Ray to Arnold. Um, and so we kind of had to find a solution for them and whether we were gonna buy a whole nother blade farm, what we were gonna do. And so uh, we started looking into a roll your own cloud solution that we kind of built. This is a very similar to what now is pretty established as a hybrid setup. Um, it was actually, the uh, genesis of it was that my friend and I, that were the developer, he was trying to manage a source gaming server for his friends that they could turn on and off programmatically through a web page without having to know how to do it so we wouldn't have to pay for hosting. And we were like, why don't we give this to Boaz and put render nodes on it? And so that kind of led to the whole system. So 
It was a VPC that joined back to on-prem through a uh, router. Uh, we spun up v EC2 instances in there. Um, we built a interface in our intranet site that allowed the artist to request nodes. Um, they would all then spin up off of our base image, call home, register themselves with the supervisor. Uh, and then they would have like a heartbeat. You could send like how long you wanted to have it time out. Back then, Amazon was like per hour pricing, I think, for the EC2 instances. So we kind of would try to pool them and not shut them down if you kind of requested too many and reuse them. So we would maximize the cost. Uh, Storage-wise, getting stuff on up to the cloud. Um, the internet wasn't that great at the time. Uh, we used basically a read-through driver. It was a fuse driver for NFS. It just mounted our on-prem storage and then as each of the nodes hit those files, it would pull them up to the cloud, cache them to the EBS, and use them off of that. Um, and it was mostly transparent to the artist, which was important. The head of the, the TD or the VFX soup would go into the internet site and request the nodes. They would show up. The artist would not really have too much interaction with it. Um, so this is an example of our internet site. If you are any web devs here, you recognize that 2012 bootstrap CSS chic of an engineering interface. And so we're, uh, this is where they'd log in. They could manage their instances, stuff like that. And it was, you know, it worked, but it had its downsides. Uh, vendor buy-in on licensing was still pretty early, and we didn't really have that. Um, managing the cube licenses, you could kind of buy them by the month or rent them by the month, but not, you know, for that burstable kind of need that you want the elasticity of the cloud. You didn't want to have to rent the high water mark for the entire month, and so there was a limit there. Um, we were also limited on Arnold licenses and stuff like that. Um, file transfer to the cloud wasn't perfect. We did a little bit of experimentation with having like a privileged node that would cache everything to it as a pre-job and then load it to the uh, sibling cloud nodes, but the complexity of that wasn't worth the overhead. We found that the compute time was drastically outpacing the transfer time, so it wasn't that big a deal. Um, the biggest problem was probably that the back end required a lot of IT specific knowledge and developers. So, you know, we had a mix of engineers at the time and, you know, from color science guys that are doing monitor calibration to traditional video engineers and just, you know, telling them, hey, it's the weekend and someone needs you to fix their spot fleet request or something. They were just like not interested. It wasn't their wheelhouse. So it was a little, uh, you know, had to shift your staff a bit and then Maintaining the system, you know, as all internal dev does, took dev time. And having, you know, oh, we want this cool feature, and you're trying to run other things. It's just the software aged a little too much. So uh, that being the case, we ran on it for a good amount of time. Staff slowly, you know, as it does, shifts. Uh, the newer staff weren't really interested in the cloud so much. They didn't have a workflow that really needed the huge expandability of the cloud. So. It wasn't that big a deal for them to have a smaller on-prem thing. They also came from a place where they used Royal Render. They switched over to there, so like porting all of our code would have been a little bit annoying. Um, and they also were primarily Adobe and Cinema 4D, and so they wanted a Windows farm. Uh, so we had a small Windows farm for a while, the dark ages there. Uh, managing Windows farm, terrible. You know, you got imaging concerns, you got user masquerading, doesn't work great, you got all kinds of problems. Um, and so we kind of lived with it for a while, but then, you know, as that started getting older, we started looking again at the next generation, and so we're kind of moving up into more present day. Um, the staff on staff now, they were looking at moving to deadline. They talked around, it seemed to be the common thing people were doing, and so they were interested in switching us off of Royal Render onto deadline. Uh, we're looking at whether we do buy another stack of uh, on-prem nodes or what do we do for that. And then um, that kind of led us into, with the, TD, the current TD, looking into AWS integration that came with Deadline kind of in, out of the box. And so I met with a couple of the guys from AWS at NABA this year, 2019, in April. And then we entered into the proof of concept phase this summer. Um, and it's great, they you know help you out, they get you everything you need to get kind of rolling, um, and it was pretty painless. Um, since we'll be talking about, in particular, the AWS portal side of things, I figured I'd just give you a quick rundown so you know the terminology we're gonna be talking about. Um, so with the AWS portal side, you don't have to have any existing infrastructure on Amazon. 
In fact, it's probably better if you don't uh, to start, uh, particularly with Amazon Portal. So everything from you know the halfway point up, the orange stuff they kind of create for you. You go into the, in, the site, you right click on deadline, create an infrastructure. They create this little cloud formation that runs. It creates a VPC, creates a gateway node that works as your I/O point to the uh, network creates a bucket for you to cache all your files, and then when you request spot fleets, they're gonna come up inside that network. Everything on the bottom half you're kind of responsible for, so you need an RCS a remote connection server that's like an HTTP gateway to your repo. And then you'll need a portal link and asset server. They kind of install together. The portal link is an SSH tunnel service that kind of gives you the connectivity out to the um, network so you don't have to have them joined. And then the asset server, Monitors kind of, it, it's an interface between your on-prem storage, you set per, certain paths and it'll handle uploading it to S3. And then as the nodes request files, it'll either pull them from S3 local or it'll upload them to um, the asset cache. And so this is like, you know, if you're looking specifically in deadline at the asset, the AWS portal side of things, this is their uh, workflow here. Cool. So. We got that working. They were kind of testing it with very small numbers of nodes, and they're mostly doing Maya and Arnold testing on that. Um, and so just to show that, like, the kind of things that just constantly come, around the end of last year, we had a long-form VFX team join the company. Their needs were completely different than the uh, front of house team, uh, which were doing commercials and animation and stuff. These guys were doing film and long-form episodic stuff. Um, they also had dramatically different security requirements. And so as part of their build out, we gave them their entire stack in a silo. So they had an, their own internet connection, they had their own switch storage, all their workstations, and a lot of uh, investment in the actual room you know, to secure them. Uh, the farm then took a back seat because they weren't 100% sure what their render patterns were gonna look like. And so we kind of just kicked the can down the road a little bit on that one. Uh, which unfortunately you can only do that so long <laughs> because they were running about, so they were running about three jobs at the time, uh, Friday night, one night in mid June, I'm ready to leave. I'm on the elevators and I get a call and hey, one of the EPs just, hey, come here, I have a question for you. And we go into a meeting and all of them are sitting there looking very dire. And they're like, we have a project we have to render out and we're, our deadline's a little tight. And so I said, let's go over it and we'll, and we'll see what we can do. You know, this is, for the course here. So uh, they were doing a job. It was a on-set shoot, which was a car shoot. And they had a car surrounded by ultra high knit LED panels. And they were going to try to do a tunnel environment on it. Um, we were going to get delivered 10K rectilinear lat longs from another studio, up res those to 20K, and then put those all into Nuke and extract four cameras per scene. It was about an eight minute total shot, so we were looking at about 40,000 frames, and they wanted it Wednesday morning on set to actually do the shoot. So they had like eight nodes <laughs> and all their workstations. They didn't have much to work with, so they were in a little bit of a panic, and they were trying to see, can we rent 250 nodes, and how do we get them, and what is our options here? And so there's just a lot of problems with hardware. Um, beyond rack space, cooling, power, finding a switch capacity for that many nodes, uh, imaging all those nodes, getting them to integrate with our storage correctly, getting the image built and licensing and all this stuff. It was Friday night at six o'clock at this point, the freight elevator was closed in Manhattan. There's no getting equipment in the building if we had it, you know? And so we were working on this proof of concept on the other side of the business. And I just said, well, we can try it. They have usage-based licensing for Nuke. Let's see what we can do. And they said, all right. And so we immediately started that Friday night um, getting it set up. And so going from proof of concept to uh, production, we kind of had to reinvent some of the stuff we did in dev, but this is kind of the workflow we went through that got us immediately going. Um, first thing we had to do was create an instant, an image to actually spin up the render node. Um, and so one of the nice things about the Amazon infrastructure so far is that when you spin up these instances, they're your instances, you're spinning them up. And so because of that, you have ownership over them. And so you can go into the AWS portal, grab the keys and SSH into these nodes and you have full root shell if you need it to do whatever you need to do. And so we jump in, we get in, we install new, we get all our dependencies straightened out. Um, pretty basic, you can spin up a deadline worker instance right out of their thing and then just configure it however you want. 
save it as an AMI in the console and it just, then you can instantiate as many of them as you want. Um, next thing we had to do is buy license credits on the Thinkbox marketplace. This is, uh, they have like a web portal where you can go on and buy them by the hour, buckets of uh, time. So bought a big bucket of nuke hours, we bought a big, a few buckets of deadline hours and then it's pretty easy, you set up some configuration in your repo and it just kind of works. Um, and then we had, of course, had to configure those two servers we were talking about on the bottom on their side because, again, they were siloed off, so we did that. And then we started working on some like little maintenance scripts and just getting our preload stuff ready for the cloud. Um, and we didn't have any of the scripts yet or any of the media for the job, so we were sending some test frames. And by Friday night, we actually had test frames going out, so it's reasonably uh, painless if you're following along in their documentation. Um, we were hoping to have frames, but we didn't get anything until Sunday morning. All day Saturday was a wash because the company that was, the studio that was providing us with those original frames were having their own problems. Uh, they were Redshift renders and they were, you know, that's another story for someone else to tell. Uh, we get our frames in, start coming in Sunday morning onto our server. And so now we're trying to start to migrate onto the live script and get going with what the actual nuke script was. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was set up the bring your own licensing. We had about 40 nuke seats, permanent seats, between all the different uh, areas of the company. And so the bring your own license is pretty cool. You set a limit in nuke with how many licenses you have on site. You tell it the rest are UBL. And as your tasks are taking the licenses, when they hit that threshold, the workers will automatically switch over and start using the cloud licenses. So that took a little bit of the bite off of uh, the cloud licensing. And especially when you're in a hybrid approach like this where you're migrating, being able to utilize those licenses while you're still paying for support is great. Um, we did a little work to simulate our on-prem tool chain path. So because we were kind of running, you know, trying to get this done as fast as possible, there's a lot of things that sometimes get missed in your map translations and stuff when moving to another service. So we wrote a little daemon that just ran on the node and kind of configured it so it looked like our on-prem uh, on system. And that way, it fails safe. So even if it wasn't the most efficient, we wouldn't have to be tracing down weird problems in a, where someone built a path in Python or something and it wasn't getting caught. Um, the nice thing then was the artist had time to sit and start evaluating different instance sizes. Amazon has a ton of different options for that. We were using all uh, spot instances, which are like the extra space on the service, so they're dramatically cheaper. They're preemptible, but we didn't run into that as being much of a problem. Uh, the one for this job they kind of focused on was C518 X large instances, which are 72 core and 144 gigs of RAM, and that seemed to be the right balance between price and performance they were happy with. And then we spent the rest of the time that night kind of chasing down any kind of outstanding bugs or issues. Uh, we had a few, um, nothing too bad. We'll go over some of them just to keep, to show the kind of like pain points we were hitting. And so first thing we hit was the BYOL bug. The uh, bring your own license stuff was only either taking on-prem or only taking cloud. And we were chasing that back and forth. It turns out it was just a weirdness in our config and our current version of deadline. We updated deadline and it went away right away. So that was pretty, you know, that took a couple hours. Uh, the asset server behavior, so the asset server mounts those local storages, like uh, kind of abstracts them away so you can see them from the node. And so we, while we were trying to recreate our on-prem, we would have to hook into those. And normally when a task starts is when those things are mounted. And so we were trying to do it at boot. And because of that, we had to contact them and they gave us the, inf the special commands to kind of mount it ahead of time. And that went pretty painless. Um, the big one was, you know, the shared AWS accounts. It's always my opinion that why, you know, why read the manual when you can bang your face against the problem for eight hours one day, right? So don't create two infrastructures in the same AWS account. I was trying to be, you know, slick and we didn't notice that part of it and we spun up the new infrastructure, the production infrastructure using the same Amazon keys. Um, that worked fine for the weekend, but then it was kind of like whoever was the last one to come up took priority it was an IAM issue with permissions. And so it was fine until about Tuesday afternoon when one of the artists on the front, the developer side decided they wanted to use their system. They brought it up and all of a sudden all the VFX guys are screaming at me that you know nothing's working. So 
This is pretty easy to solve. Uh, Amazon has something called an organization. You can set multiple Amazon accounts inside of that. And so we just kind of gave each department their own Amazon account and they can run wild with that. Um, default instance limits. This is less of a problem we hit that we couldn't have foreseen, but by default, Amazon puts instance limits on your account just to keep you from either spinning up 10,000 nodes accidentally and not <laughs> wanting to pay for them, or because they may not have that capacity available. Uh, not, uh, not really <laughs> something you'll ever probably bump into uh, with Amazon, but um, normally you go through a web form on their site and you say, I need more instance limit, and a day or two they bump your account up. Uh, this is just kind of a warning. If you're working on it, put that in sooner than later or talk to the guys that are helping you with your POC to bump that up right away because we hit that basically Sunday night when we first started putting frames through and I had to kind of go in through chat and spend a little time. They got it done in about an hour or so, but that was a, our fault there. And then license usage. When you're running 300 nodes overnight, it uses a lot of no, uh, licenses quick, more quicker than you'd think. Um, the Nuke stuff, not so much because of the shared licensing, but the deadline licenses were getting sucked up really quick. Uh, I was up all night kind of buying bunches of licenses. I likened it to like shoveling licenses into the furnace to keep the render farm going. But uh, this was kind of only really going to affect us a little bit because going forward, deadline is going to include the license for the deadline renderer, the worker, in the... Uh, if you're running out of Amazon, it just comes with it, so you don't have to buy it. And that's actually pretty good because they're about 10 cents an hour, I think, for those licenses, and that's just going to come along as part of it. So um, the results, the project delivered on time. Fortunately, they got all their frames out. It was actually just on time. I came in on Wednesday morning, and the artist was like walking out at the same time from the building uh, to bring this, the you know, to bring the final delivery. The producers, of course, were very happy. They slept very soundly while this was going on. And the client was happy because they got, you know, we got final approval, everything was great, and the shoot went on without any kind of hiccup. Um, the artists, though, were now, the ones that were preempted by all of this craziness were now behind on their main project, which was uh, the main project that was, had been going on all the time. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about them because they haven't actually been released yet, but this project, uh, we fortunately, we were a little behind, they kind of, needed a little TLC from, you know, to keep them catching up. They weren't terribly behind, but after the other artists in the room saw the success that the other guys were having with the Amazon and seeing 300 nodes just blowing through all their frames, they were all like, when can we use this, you know? And so we said, well, we'll just go ahead with it. So this was a completely different style workflow. So instead of Nuke, it was all Arnold renders and then Houdini fluid simulations, which we then rendered via Mantra. So going directly from one workflow to the other just kind of shows the flexibility of the system. We were able to pivot almost immediately. We had a good amount of experience spinning up instances and making our own. Uh, Ar uh, Arnold, they have an instance type you can use that's already pre-made if you're using the version of Maya and Arnold that they are using, uh, but we made our own anyway. Um, and then Houdini, there wasn't one, so we had to go, again, build it from scratch. Uh, Main differences on this one were the cache sizes. Houdini was generating huge amounts of cache that the default AMI like sizes just weren't keeping up. The disks were filling up on them, both on the cache and on the local volume. So when you create the AMI, you can kind of go in and specify what kind of volumes are going to attach to it. And we just uh, bumped that up to the, however many frames we were doing. Um, there's no usage-based licensing for Houdini. So for all the H engine renders, we had to actually go straight to Houdini and rent them for as actual licenses. It wasn't that big a deal because you tend to do less simulation processes than the render and the mantra stuff was easy to get a lot of tokens for. Um, they also had much higher memory requirements. So we were having, a, they were still using those 18 XLs to start and then what they noticed was in some of the very complicated scenes, they were getting like seg vaults and stuff like that and so the thing was crashing. So we bumped them up. They went over to the M5 from the C5, so the memory focused over the compute focused nodes. Um, they were actually using M5 metal, which are bare metal instances, which is 96 cores and 384 gigs of RAM each. And so they were able, those were more powerful than the workstations they had on premise. And so he was just spinning up a ton of those and the simulation guy was very happy. Um, the other thing was the task times were a little long, so when he was doing the simulation, because they're not kind of frame independent, they were running like a 24-hour sim on a single task on a preemptible cloud node. And so as the engineer, I'm kind of like 
cringing at the fact that this thing could go away at any time. And they were like, oh, it's only 26 hours. Look how fast it's going. And so we found that because the download for the asset server fired at the end of the task, we had to kind of go in and kind of prod the nodes to send back those caches in the interim so that the artist could actually see what was coming out and get an idea if he needed to change anything or optimize the caches or anything like that. So uh, just some of the specs I got from the artist uh, prior to coming here. It was a 160 frame breach and splash sim that he was doing, a uh, narrow band flip sim with 25 million particles and then three passes of foam, a mist, and a spray. The foam was like 17 billion voxel render or something like that. And then uh, each of the renders took from an hour to five hours on those 96 core machines. Um, the ones that were doing the surface displacement and the uh, refraction and stuff took a little longer, but ultimately they were uh, moving through pretty quick and they were ultimately pretty happy. Um, kind of the point of a lot of that is that with these different workloads, we were able, as a small place with you know a pretty agile development team, to just kind of go all in right away from proof of concept and just, it's already, it's there. It's not like it's uh, something only for like, you know, a six month time frame to plan out and just use it. I mean, it's kind of there and you're only paying for it as you use it. So it's kind of worthwhile to kind of jump in and start playing with it uh, right away. Um, going forward, just to talk about, uh, where we're going now. This project, the one that we were just talking about with the simulations, literally was approved, final approval, and delivered while I was on my way out to LA for SIGGRAPH. So we're just now getting to the point where the department is taking a break and gonna have some downtime, which means we can actually do some work and take some of the lessons learned and, apply, and apply them so it's not such a slapdash kinda on the fly setup. Um, first thing that is probably our priority is to get the spot event plugin working. This is a uh, plugin um, that Deadline has where it runs when the housekeeping happens. And what it'll do is it checks the different groups, sees if there's a lot of tasks waiting for work, and then it'll automatically spin up a spot request, a spot fleet for you. Um, and then you, you can specify you know, a salad of uh, different instance types and kind of have a nice little diverse fleet there uh, so that you get, you're always gonna get your full capacity. Um, this is nice because as of right now, the kind of artists that were running on this were like very into it and happy to kind of go in and I want, you know, 300 of this and I want 80 of that and kind of really handcrafting it. But that's not how a lot of the, a lot of the artists are gonna to wanna to submit their job and not have to think about going in and making notes. So um, this will help take some of that off and plus it just makes it so you don't even have to think about it. Um, and by the end of that project, I don't, the local nodes were almost not even being run, you know? So it's pretty, uh, the price was right. Everything, the work, the speed was right. The client, they didn't really notice much of a difference in terms of frames coming back or uploads or anything like that. So it was a pretty good uh, result all in all. Um, talking about the scalability, another place to scale that the cloud is kind of a great place is on the workstation side. You've probably seen a lot of people talking about that. We got a couple of those Terra, the Terra DG Zero clients in and you can kind of spin up G3 instances or now, as they were talking about before, they have G4 instances coming out, which are even more powerful and run the full workstation on there. Um, for some of our workflows, like on the color specific ones, we're waiting for the, the PC over IP ultras coming out, which is gonna have 10 bit color. But for right now, for like Nuke, where they don't really care too much about the bit depth, uh, they're very happy to be able to, you know, when freelancers come in, not have to sit there with five workstations gathering dust so they can have their friend, you know, people come in and then now they just have a zero client and a couple monitors collecting dust, which they would have anyway. So it works out pretty good for that kind of thing. And then ideally you move into the studio on the cloud, which is all over the signs. Luckily I put it in my slides. Uh, this is the idea you bring your storage up there, you got your license server up there, you got all your workstations attached to that storage, maybe you have an FSX or something else, and then your repos up there, your render farms up there, and you just don't even have anything on-prem at all. Um, we're really looking at this, we have one situation where we're in a city, we have an existing location with a little half rack, which is fine, but the building's a heritage building. Very difficult to get cooling and power and a machine, put a full machine room in and they're like, hey, we wanna put, 10 VFX guys in that uh, building, it's much easier to put them all on Amazon, get a nice connection out, Amazon direct right to the, you know, 
to the region and then just have them all just have everything on their desk or even if they want to use a laptop or a thin client, they can. Um, it also takes away some of the privileged uh, position of our New York facility. Our New York facility has so much investment in it. It's kind of the hub of our hub and spoke of all of our facilities and because of that, it's always treated slightly differently in all of our configurations. And so being able to move all that stuff kind of out to the cloud and have all of our remote sites work off of that same thing, um, pretty fruitful. So uh, that's it. I mean, we've had great time uh, working with it. It's really powerful stuff. And we've had a lot of success just going in there as an engineer and a developer. It's great because you have, it's so low level. You can do whatever the heck you want with it. and. Uh, yeah, so I guess I have a little bit of time if anyone has any questions, otherwise we'll wrap up, so. Uh, the, the Houdini license server, was that local and, uh, or was it an instance on the cloud? Yeah, so we have a local Houdini license server already just for our interactive licenses and stuff. And so with the um, license server, there's a license forwarder and as part of the portal, link service, which is the SSH channel thing, you can specify like ports that you want to forward back to on-site. And so you can say, this port needs to come back to my on-prem and it points to this IP address and it builds you a tunnel. And so then you can just set your, you know, license server config on the Houdini node to point to the gateway at that port and it kind of resolves itself. Um, and that we used for HN. You also need to do that for Mantra also because it still needs to get a token even though the license doesn't cost anything. You still need to go to side effects and ask them for a bunch of, as many as you're gonna need those mantra licenses and put them on a license server. Even though it technically is free, they still pull one out. Um, but yeah, you can do, I mean, it's really just an SSH tunnel and it's just mapping that port back. So you, anything that you need an IP connection essentially back to on-prem, you can go through that service and it works out pretty good. That's also how the uh, bring your own license works. It points at one port and then once it hits that limit, it changes the environment variable to go out through the cloud usage-based licensing. Uh, would you say overall this was a cost effective relative to local rendering? Yeah, it's actually, I mean, so they were running those, we were in US East 2, which because we had existing infrastructure in one, we were just running in Ohio. And like that M5, uh, metal instance, which was 96 cores and 384 gigs was about 30 cents an hour to run. And we weren't paying any licensing after that because it was mantra. And so, you, you know, the, to try to run the 300 of those locally for 30 cents an hour, good luck, you know what I mean? Like, and then you're stuck with them at the end. So it was definitely being able to scale up like that, the producers were happy definitely on their numbers. We did look, we had done some previous work with like zinc and stuff like that, and the numbers definitely came in below that. Um, but because you're going direct to the provider, you know, you're going as low as you can go on the food chain, so. Hey, um, I've sort of long been thinking about this studio and the cloud thing, but um, I don't know, there, there aren't too many people doing it, and um, I've been trying to think through what are the, the negatives of, of a studio in a cloud. Um, seems like there's a lot of positives because you're not going to be paying for ingress and egress. You know, everything's always up there all the time, and you're just kind of paying for pixels. Sure. Um, but, yeah, have you thought through what, it, what are the downsides of that? Yeah, so not every fit right now works great in the cloud. Um, we do a lot of client soup sessions. And so you have an edit box with an artist in the room and a, and a client paying to be in that room. And we have a 65 inch OLED on the wall. That's the pre preview monitor, for example. We do a lot of broadcast. It's less VFX, more broadcast end. And getting that video signal back with zero you know, corruption on that image and getting it to play full frame rate, you know, It'll work. You could probably find a way to do it, but if you get a hiccup, they're going to go, why are you using the cloud instead of just putting it in the machine room when it worked in the machine room? So it's, you know, it's a tool, ultimately, um, for visual effects stuff and things where you're not client souped. Uh, it's definitely very interesting. Um, some of the stuff working remote can be a little tricky. We've gotten around some of that just because we do work remote with different on-prem locations, but they were talking earlier about, you know, not having face to face with some people, especially if you have a, you know, your virtual workstations are all over the world. 
you know, we had an artist in Brazil that was using Teradigia to connect or something like that. You don't have that face-to-face, -face, it can be there, but, um, you know, some people still like to have a piece of machine that they use and they're confident in, and so it also may take a little bit of a specific type of artist, you know, that's kind of got buy-in on it before you, that they're convinced of it, but there's not many downsides other that you can, you know, offset some way, at least, that I think of anyway. I mean, when I think about the, the, you know, an artist owning a machine, like when you buy a machine, it's in the, it's in the building, and it might get used for eight hours of the day. Um, I, I feel like with the studio in the cloud, you could shut down what you don't need for the time when you're not using it, and that would be. Yeah, so be you would, you would probably have some kind of a broker that manages your virtual machines. So when you turn on your machine, is might not even be spun up. It might even be immutable and not even exist. And it just instantiates a new one and configures itself. Um, so managing all that. They did add something that manages the render nodes similar to that in a couple, like a month ago to deadline that shuts down machines you're not using and like tries to find good prices. And so similarly for the G3 stuff, that would be a big uh, sell there. Um, I have a friend that does that doesn't even own a computer at home anymore. He just does all virtual workstation for the few times he does it and even does like Parsec and does gaming and stuff over it. Um, he kind of moved away from it though because he does a lot of hardware development and the USB uh, abstraction isn't 100% there. And so, but he's been running on that for a year or more before he switched back. So, um, yeah, definitely you pay only for what you're using and it's off. You know what I mean? Now we kind of try to offset the on-prem hardware by making it a render node at night. But even then, it's just making the best of a worst, bad situation kind of idea. So, cool. That's if that's it. Then I'll say goodbye and have a good time in the rest of the show. Almost over.